Hello everybody, welcome to Deeksha Online. So we are going to continue with this chapter that is human reproduction. Now before I discuss with this lecture, as usual, we will be going to the chapter overview. Till now we have learnt about the male and the female reproductive system, correct? Both the structural and the functional aspects of them. Then we have learned about the process of sperm and egg formation that is gametogenesis. We also learned about the reproductive cycle, the monthly reproductive cycle that happens in female primates and humans, which is menstrual cycle. Then in the previous lecture, we had learned about the process of fertilization and implantation, which is the attachment of the embryo to the uterus. Then we will now be learning about pregnancy, embryonic development and finally childbirth or parturition and lactation. So this is the chapter overview for the PU syllabus uh, prescribed by the NCRT. A quick review of what we had learnt in the previous lecture. Now in the previous lecture we had learnt about the meaning of the term fertilization. So what is fertilization, the fusion of the sperm and the egg resulting in the formation of a diploid zygote, correct? Then we had also discussed about the four steps in the mechanism of fertilization. Then we had discussed about the XX and the XY type of sex determination in humans. The process of cleavage, cleavage which is the mitotic divisions, the rapid and repeated mitotic divisions of the zygote. We had also discussed about the earliest embryo, some of the early stages of embryo development which included us discussing the structure of the blastocyst. And lastly, we saw how the blastocyst attaches itself to the inner wall of the uterus. The inner wall of the uterus is nothing but the endometrium. And this process where the blastocyst gets embedded firmly in the uterine endometrium is referred to as implantation all right so i think you got a clear picture of what we have discussed until now and from the chapter overview it is clear that now we are going to discuss we are going to focus on the next aspect in this chapter which is referred to as the pregnancy so how do you define pregnancy now pregnancy is actually a condition Okay, so you would call a woman as pregnant if she has a young one, a developing young in her womb or uterus. So if a woman is carrying a viable young developing embryo inside her uterus or inside her womb, then she is said to be pregnant. So pregnancy refers to a condition. All right, fine. Now, when the mother is pregnant, now during the time of pregnancy, a lot of changes, physiological changes are happening in the mother's body. Let us see some of the important changes. The major changes that happen are there is increased production of hormones in the mother's system. Okay, now why should there be a very high level of hormones in the maternal body? Now the three reasons why the mother's body has high levels of some of the hormones. Now some of the hormones such as you have estrogen, you have progestogen, you have cortisol, you have prolactin and thyroxine. So these are some of the hormones which increase in their concentration in the mother's system. And now what, what are they useful for? They provide a support to the fetal growth. They help the mother's body to adapt to all the changes that are happening. So it brings about certain metabolic changes in the mother. And it also helps the mother to sustain, to maintain and to sustain the pregnancy. So remember that during the time of pregnancy, a lot of changes are happening in the mother's system. And one of those changes include hormonal variations there is increased production of some of the hormones and if they ask you why these hormones are increasing in their concentration you should remember that it is for these three major reasons all right okay now last class we had discussed that the blastocyst undergoes implantation and do you remember i had told you that the blastocyst develops 
finger like projections which are called the chorionic villi how 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 do you all remember the structure of the blastocyst we had shown that it has a roughly spherical structure with a layer of cells forming its wall isn't it its wall is one cell layer thick and then we had shown that it has a cavity filled with the fluid inside and inside there is a cluster there is a lump of cells inside yes can you all tell me what did we call these cells these cells were called the inner cell mass this lump or this cluster was called the inner cell mass so this is how the blastocyst look like isn't it and i had told you when it attaches to the uterine endometrium this trophoblast the outermost layer do you remember this outermost layer is called the trophoblast this trophoblast differentiates into two layers or two types of tissues now this is the tissue which i am showing here which has these finger like projections now these finger like projections are referred to as the chorionic villi okay and what is the uniqueness of this tissue i had told you that it is nothing but a multi nucleate mass of cytoplasm which do not have boundaries so basically there are many many nuclei and the cellular boundaries are not laid between them so it appears to be a multi nucleate mass of cytoplasm if you remember we had called this tissue that is formed by during the time of implantation we had called it the syncytio or the synchytio trophoblast yes or no okay and what about the cellular part of trophoblast this is outer layer which remains cellular which has distinct boundaries between them this cellular part we had called it as the cytotrophoblast all right so this much you know that when the blastocyst attaches itself to the uterine endometrium it differentiates into two two tissues one is referred to as the synchytiotrophoblast and the cellular part is referred to as the cytotrophoblast and the synchytiotrophoblast is what develops these finger like projections and what are these finger like projections referred to as they are referred to as the chorionic villi all right fine so moving on why should these chorionic villi be there why should the surface of the synchytiotrophoblast be thrown into these finger like projections which are referred to as chorionic villi now let us see what happens with the help of these chorionic villi remember we are talking about the process of implantation isn't it and now we are about to begin the discussion on placenta so this much is clear to all of you formation of chorionic villi which consists of finger like projections by the blastocyst when it attaches to the uterine endometrium now what happens to this chorionic villi is if you remember there is the uterine endometrium now this is the uterine endometrium let me not draw it entirely because i want to show a portion of it which is invaded by what what is this the cytotro the synchytiotrophoblast of the blastocyst and let me show the cytotrophoblast so this is the cytotrophoblast yes so what are these finger like structure this is the endometrium so let me just try to distinguish the two so these are the endo this is the endometrium which is the what is endometrium it is the innermost lining of the inner lining of the wall of the uterus okay so now see how the blastocyst with the inner cell mass this is the inner cell mass and the blastocyst has attached to the endometrium and it has given out 
the syncytiotrophoblast. Can you all see how the syncytiotrophoblast is literally burying itself into the endometrium? Isn't it? It digs deeper and deeper into the endometrium. Obviously, I had told you in the beginning of this chapter when we had discussed about the female reproductive system that this layer the endometrium is very very rich in blood supply so you can imagine that when this chorionic villi all these chorionic villi are trying to bury themselves in it is trying to bury itself in the uterine endometrium what's going to happen a lot of ble bleeding happens here and blood starts getting collected in pools isn't it the uterine blood because the endometrium has a lot of blood vessels so those blood vessels which are present in the endometrium they start rupturing because the because of this chorionic villi which is trying to invade the uterine tissue and the mother's blood starts collecting in spaces see now these spaces are called the maternal blood sinuses now why is it called maternal blood sinuses because where is it found it's found in the uterine endometrium so obviously it has the blood belonging to the mother a sinus is a space a blood sinus is filled with blood so this these spaces which are filled with mother's blood are referred to as the maternal blood sinuses now why the mother's blood is collecting in pools like that because of this chorionic villi so you can imagine this is the chorionic villi the chorionic villi is now in direct contact with these blood filled spaces isn't it so where you have the mother's blood so the chorionic villi are literally bathed they are literally dipped in the mother's blood and they start deriving nutrition from the mother's blood isn't it now this connection that is formed between the chorionic villus of the developing embryo and the uterine tissue of the mother see here the chorionic villi of the developing embryo and the uterine tissue they become interdigitated they become interlocked with each other and they jointly form a structural and a functional unit between the fetus and the mother's body and what do we call this structural and functional unit this is referred to as placenta okay so you all can imagine now that why this chorionic villus should have these finger like projections because first of all it has to establish connection with the mother's blood and then it has to draw nutrition from the mother's blood so obviously it should have a greater surface area isn't it you all agree with me because it has to have a greater surface area it has to be provided with lot of finger like projections so i hope it is clear now first there is formation of this region what did we call this region the syncytiotrophoblast and then we saw that it develops finger like projections called chorionic villus and see how it is burying into the endometrium it is invading the mother's uterus and in the process of its invasion it leads to rupturing of blood vessels which gets and the blood gets collected in spaces like this what are these blood filled spaces in the mother's endometrium called these are called the maternal blood sinuses and the chorionic villi comes in so here you can see the chorionic villi comes in direct contact with the mother's blood in these blood filled spaces it comes in direct contact with the mother's blood and as a result now it forms a very very intimate connection a structural and a functional unit which is referred to as the placenta clear to all of you so please learn this definition of placenta try not to modify the terms which are used the scientific terminology must be used such as chorionic villi uterine tissue and a structural and a functional unit so usually in the board exam they will look for such terminology so it is a very important definition question for you so please go through the definition of placenta so now what has been established is a very firm connection between the developing embryo and the mother's system 
so all the nutrients from the mother's blood will be drawn into the developing embryo across this connection this structural and functional unit that is referred to as placenta clear to all of you now you can see how the fetus is developing inside the mother's womb so this is the uterine uh, they have given the outline of the uterus here okay now inside the uterus you all can see how the young one is developing okay now the embryo is almost taking the shape of a uh, fetus here it's it has a curved structure as you can see okay uh, so and see how the embryo is present it is suspended in a cavity now this cavity is called the amniotic cavity it is filled with a fluid called amniotic fluid which protects the embryo from mechanical injury it acts as a mechanical shock absorber okay and it also protects the developing embryo from dehydration okay and then you can see this connection between the developing embryo and this is the placenta isn't it so this connection is referred to as the umbilical cord so umbilical cord acts as a connection between the developing embryo and the placenta and what are these tree like patterns which you see inside the placenta now these tree like patterns are nothing but the the chorionic villus isn't it we saw that the chorionic villi why should the chorionic villi have so many finger like projections to increase the surface area of absorption isn't it so from this with this diagram you can appreciate what are all the structures which are associated with the developing fetus inside the mother's womb so in fact the title they have mentioned it as fetus and in the diagram they have mentioned it as embryo so when do you call an embryo as a fetus is something that you should remember so i think you should all know that after i'm writing it here after 9 weeks of embryonic development Nine weeks of embryonic development means I am taking what as a reference here, that is from the day of fertilization. So whenever fertilization happened, that will be day zero. Okay, so fertilization onwards up to about nine weeks. So you tell me how many months have passed? About two point one months. Nine weeks means two point one months. So, about nine weeks of embryonic development has completed in the mother's system from the day of fertilization. Now you can call the developing embryo as a fetus. So whatever structure you see before the nine weeks, then you will call it as say embryo. So embryo is. before attainment of 9 weeks of development but after 9 weeks of development of embryonic development we will call the embryo as fetus 9 weeks means from the day of fertilization from when fertilization happened 2.1 months have been passed okay so this will help you understand what is the difference between an embryo and a fetus and from the picture you can also see that the fetus has developed some features what are some of the features usually between 8 to 9 weeks of embryonic development once again i am telling you whenever i say embryonic development i am starting from the day of the day when fertilization took place so by the time the embryo has become 8 to 9 weeks old from the day of fertilization we can see that it starts developing certain facial features its ear starts taking shape 
its eyelids are formed but the eyelids are always closed okay so, so these are some of the and most importantly you can say that the genitals appear differentiated so these are some additional points i'm giving you you may take this down for your interest those who are aiming for competitive it may help them so genitals appear differentiated so these are the features of a fetus so when do you call the human embryo as a fetus please bear in mind it must have completed how many weeks how many weeks must have passed from the day of fertilization 8 to 9 weeks ideally 9 weeks that is 2.1 months okay what are some of the features of a, a fetus a fetus is like a miniature human being because it has facial features you can see its eyelids you can see its ear you can see its genitals okay genitals appear to be differentiated although they are not that clear so this gives you an idea of how a fetus would look like and this picture gives you an idea of how it appears to be sitting inside the womb of the mother developing inside the womb of the mother clear to all of you what are the functions of placenta now a very important three or five mark question in your board exam functions of placenta we saw that in placenta dash is in direct contact with dash so i'm not going to give an answer to this you will find out a dash of the embryo is in direct contact with dash of the mother's body so can anyone think of the answer and tell me so dash of the embryo means the chorionic villi of the embryo is in direct contact with the blood of the mother's uterus i told you that blood starts collecting in pools called maternal blood sinuses and the chorionic villi is in direct contact with the maternal blood and this connection is called this unit is called placenta what is the use of establishing a direct connection with the mother's blood so one thing is the fetus can directly derive oxygen and nutrients from the mother's blood another thing is because there is contact with mother's blood the there is removal of carbon dioxide from the fetus because obviously the fetus cannot use its lungs at this stage remember i had told you in the previous slide that the fetus is fully immersed in a liquid called amniotic liquid yes or no so it has to have a mechanism to give away the respiratory waste like carbon dioxide so diffusion happens carbon dioxide gets eliminated into the mother's blood through the placenta what else can get eliminated from the fetus excretory or metabolic waste okay so elimination of carbon dioxide and elimination of excretory or metabolic waste then it acts as a very important point they may ask you to list out some of the hormones secreted by the placenta all right so one important thing you should remember here is that the placenta itself functions as an endocrine gland because it secretes so many hormones human chorionic gonadotropin abbreviated as hcg human placental lactogen abbreviated as hpl it also secretes estrogens and progestogens see so many hormones are being secreted by the placenta isn't it so basically the placenta itself is a it also functions as a endocrine tissue so it's important you learn these hormones because they may ask you a question regarding what are some of the hormones that are secreted by the placenta okay then it facilitates transport of antibodies very very important now obviously in the developing fetus there is no immune system isn't it so there should be something to protect the developing fetus against germs so what does the placenta take up from the mother's blood surprisingly the placenta is permeable to antibodies so it receives antibodies from the mother's blood which helps in protecting the developing young 
against pathogens. You all know that antibodies are chemical substances that fight against foreign substances, foreign potentially dangerous substances called antigens. Correct? So the overview of the functions of placenta. Oxygen and nutrient supply, carbon dioxide and excretory product elimination, functions as an endocrine gland. It also takes up antibodies, transport of antibodies from the mother to reinforce the immune system of the developing young, to protect the young from pathogens. Okay, so these are the functions of placenta. Now there is one more hormone that is mentioned in the textbook, but it is very closely mentioned to placenta. So many students confuse it as a hormone secreted by the placenta. Although small amounts of this hormone is secreted by the placenta as well, but it is clearly mentioned and you should know that this is a hormone that is mostly secreted by ovary and this hormone is called relaxin. So relaxin is a hormone that is secreted by the ovary okay, in the later stages of pregnancy, isn't it? And it peaks during the time of delivery. So why should it peak during the time of delivery and why should it be produced during the later stages of pregnancy? That means probably it has some role to play when it comes to childbirth or parturition. So you all are aware that during childbirth, the child has to pass through the birth canal of the mother. What is birth canal? Do you remember? We had discussed it in one of the previous lectures. The cervical canal and the vaginal canal together constitute the birth canal. Yes, so since the child has to pass through it and it is a very narrow passage for the child to come through. So what this hormone does is it relaxes the ligaments of the hip region, the pelvic ligaments of the mother and also relaxes the abdominal muscles of the mother so that it can bring about easy childbirth or parturition. Is it clear to all of you? So relaxin, as the name itself indicates, it relaxes the ligaments and the muscles of the abdominal or the pelvic region of the mother during the time of delivery to ease the process of childbirth. Okay? Any doubts in this? Please go through it again. It is a hormone secreted by as per the NCRT, although other sources tell us that it is also secreted by the placenta. Let us stick to what is given in the textbook. It is secreted by the ovary during the later stages of pregnancy, during the time of delivery. Okay. Now moving on to embryonic development. What just happened? Placenta formation happened. For placenta to form, what had to happen? The embryo had to attach to the uterine endometrium. Which stage of embryo attached to the uterine endometrium? Yes, blastocyst, which has more than 16 or 32 up to 64 blastomias. Isn't it? So now what has been established? The mother is now pregnant. Only after implantation, that happens by the end of 7 days after fertilization, only after implantation, we say that the mother is now pregnant. And let us see what are all some of the embryonic developmental stages that usually follow. The first thing that happens the moment the embryo undergoes implantation is, you all know the lump of cells inside the inner cell mass. Now that is the one that gives rise to the embryo. It starts differentiating into three layers. We have learnt this in your basics, animal kingdom, isn't it? What are the three germ layers since we are all triploblastic organisms? And the germ layers are the earliest layers that are formed during embryonic development. So the inner cell mass differentiates into outer ectoderm, inner endoderm and middle mesoderm. That means the embryo now has three distinct layers that is outer ectoderm, inner endoderm, middle mesoderm. These are the three germ layers which are capable of giving rise to all the tissues and organs in the adult. And how is the inner cell mass uh, having all this capacity to develop into these three layers and these three layers are in turn capable of giving rise to all the organs and tissues in the human body? That is because the inner cell mass consists of a special 
class of cells which are referred to as stem cells. So stem cells have a wide variety of fates in the sense they can grow to develop, they can give rise to many 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 cell types in the body. And see how the embryo is, now you can actually call it the fetus, isn't it? Now this is a wonderful a real image of the human fetus as you can see. See it's having a curved body now, correct? And you can also see the tail bud over here, you can see the limb bud, isn't it? Now you can see the arm bud which has developed hand and you can see webbed digits over here. Isn't it? Now web digits mostly appear during the sixth week after fertilization. So probably this is the sixth week or it is much later actually it has almost taken the shape of the fetus. But since you can see the webbed digits over here, you can see very clearly the web digits are found mostly during week six. They begin to form during week six. And see how the head occupies much of the size of the embryo. Isn't it? The head is so massive over here. Clear? So this is the embryonic development, the initial stages of embryonic development that we need to know about. Timeline. What are the salient features or timeline of human embryonic development? So they may ask you this as a five mark question. What are the steps in embryonic development? They may ask you. So you will have to learn this this entire sequence of events you will have to learn for a five mark question in your board exam. You know the duration of human pregnancy. It is about nine months. And what is this duration called? It is called gestation period. Isn't it? Okay. By one month. So one month of pregnancy is completed. One month means four weeks. So by the end of four weeks, the embryo's heart is formed. Do you understand what I'm saying? And one of the earliest signs of the developing embryo, now by the fourth week of pregnancy, that is by, uh, on the completion of about actually about three weeks or approximately four weeks of pregnancy the heart starts beating with a definite rhythm and this is the time when the doctor can actually sense hear the heartbeat sound of the fetus using a stethoscope of the embryo using a stethoscope so this is the earliest signs of the developing embryo that is the heartbeat and the heart has completely formed and it starts be beating rhythmically by one month of pregnancy. Is that clear to all of you? Okay. By the end of the second month, eight weeks, the fetus develops limbs and digits. I had told you that by the end of the second month, that is approximately eight weeks, eight to nine weeks from the time of fertilization i told you we call it as the fetus so by the second month you can start calling the embryo as fetus can you recall some of the features i had discussed with you yes facial features are formed eyelids are formed but they are closed the ear takes shape the genitals appear to be well differentiated isn't it? So now you can call, after the second month, you can call the embryo as a fetus. By the end of the first trimester, one of the major milestones in human embryonic development, that means it has been three months since the mother became pregnant. All the major organs are formed, that is limbs and external genitalia. Isn't it? So 3 months is equal to approximately about 12 weeks. So 12 weeks of uh, pregnancy has become completed. And this is the time when you can actually detect the sex of the child. You can predict the sex of the child because what is completely developed? The external genitalia has developed. Okay? By the end of another major milestone in the human embryonic development... That is the second trimester, that means the mother has completed 
six months of pregnancy 24 weeks of pregnancy she has completed by then her child develops fine hair of the fine hair on the body and we call this fine hair as the lan you go so it is fine and unpigmented hair that covers most of the body parts of the fetus but not throughout much later in the stages of development say for example by about the eighth month of development or eight fours are 32 weeks of development this lanugo starts disappearing from most of the body parts and it remains only in the upper arm and the shoulder okay and actually to be very precise when does the lanugo start appearing now the lanugo starts appearing on the head it starts on the head and then it starts appearing all over the body okay now just for your information now the lanugo on the head it starts appearing on the 10th week of embryonic life i'm stressing upon this again and again for all of you when i say embryonic life i am taking into account the day of fertilization from the day of fertilization okay so basically appearance of lanugo which are fine hair and which happen from uh, which appear on the head to begin with and that happens on the 10th week of embryonic life. Then, so in the textbook it is mentioned that when the mother has completed 6 months of pregnancy, her body is covered with fine hair, uh, I mean the body of her child is covered with fine hair and eyelids separate, eyelashes are formed, okay. These are some of the important timelines, milestones. And then the end of nine months, that means the fetus is ready to take birth. The mother has completed nine months of pregnancy. So the fetus is fully developed and is ready for delivery. Clear to all of you. So this timeline, please go through it. Like I said, they may ask you as a five mark question, what are the salient features of embryonic development? You have to write this timeline. Okay. Now the next major part, we just saw that once 9 months of pregnancy is completed, I told you that the child is ready, the fetus is ready for birth. And we had already discussed that the gestation period is 9 months, duration of pregnancy. At the end of pregnancy, now this is the definition of parturition, very important one mark question. At the end of pregnancy, there is vigorous contractions of the uterus and this causes the expulsion or the delivery of the fetus. This process of the delivery of the fetus in brackets, childbirth in common terms, is technically referred to as parturition. Clear to all of you? So when does parturition happen? It happens at the end of pregnancy. So go through the definition clearly. End of pregnancy, vigorous contraction of the uterus, causes expulsion and this delivery of the fetus or childbirth is called parturition. Clear to all of you? Parturition is induced. If they ask you a question, one mark or two mark, they may ask you what induces? Where does the signal for parturition originate from? Signals for parturition they originate from mature fetus and placenta please note this down it is very important the signal for childbirth originates from the mature fetus and the placenta and what happens because of this signal it causes mild uterine contraction and this is called fetal ejection reflex these contractions are called fetal ejection reflex so what causes these contraction what are the signals responsible for this contraction yes the fully mature fetus as well as placenta 
and what does this signal result in it results in mild uterine contractions called fetal ejection reflex is it clear to all of you this triggers the release of oxytocin by the posterior pituitary gland so let me try to put it here this is the uterus of the mother and the embryo is developing inside the fetus is fully formed now it uh, even though this doesn't look like a fetus pardon me for that so you have the embryo which is developing inside the uterus okay and now this embryo fully formed embryo and i mean the fully formed fetus and the placenta there is a connection between the developing fetus and the mother that is placenta what do they lead to they cause uterine contractions see the uterus is contracting now these signals from the uterine contractions they reach the mother's posterior pituitary isn't it now these contractions which are caused by the fetus and the placenta they are carried to the through nerves they are carried to the mother's posterior pituitary now the mother's posterior pituitary releases a hormone called oxytocin and now this oxytocin again acts on the uterine wall and causes further contractions see it's a chain reaction no first there are contractions which happen which is called the fetal ejection reflex then it is picked up by the posterior pituitary which then releases that's why oxytocin is called the birth hormone so name the birth hormone which facilitates childbirth oxytocin and who releases oxytocin it is the mother's posterior pituitary gland in response to what in response to mild uterine contractions called fetal ejection reflex and what does oxytocin do oxytocin will again act on the uterine wall and it will cause further uterine contractions when this keeps happening this is called positive feedback mechanism all right so positive feedback mechanism this is what brings about increased strength of uterine contractions imagine if these keeps happening and again and again and again the contractions of the uterus will increase only and that will allow the child the fully formed fetus to take birth okay so please remember the mechanism of parturition and the hormone that is involved in parturition is oxytocin so like i said where does oxytocin act it acts on uterine myometrial muscle so remember the target for oxytocin is the myometrium of the uterine wall because the myometrium is made up of smooth muscle fibers and that causes further stronger contractions which stimulates again that stimulates more release of oxytocin so more contraction more oxytocin and more oxytocin more contraction so it's linked so it only increases each other's activity and that's why it is called a positive feedback mechanism when one activity increases the other and the other increases the uh, the first activity when both of them increase each other's activity then only it is called a positive feedback mechanism clear so i hope you understood the mechanism of childbirth that is parturition ultimately what happens this leads to the expulsion of the baby through the birth canal and this process of delivery of the child or childbirth is called parturition and later what happens when the baby comes out even the placenta is also ultimately expelled out of the uterus
all right so this marks the end of the childbirth the next step now once the child is born for the first one month of the life of the child the child is considered to be a neonate a newborn baby isn't it and now the child has to entirely depend upon the mother's milk and the milk is secreted by the mammary glands and when do the mammary glands start undergoing differentiation and development during pregnancy itself they undergo differentiation and by the end of pregnancy they start producing milk again a one mark definition question lactation the, this process where the mammary glands undergo differentiation and they start producing milk towards the end of pregnancy is called what is it called lactation and this helps the mother in nourishing or suckling or feeding the newborn child the neonatal milk during the initial few days of lactation is called colostrum it is called the first milk and it is yellow in color because it is rich in antibodies okay so remember this first milk that is produced during the initial few days of lactation by the mother is called colostrum and why should this colostrum be so rich in antibodies because it is essential for the baby to develop immunity because a baby's immune system is still not fully developed and now it is exposed to the outside atmosphere until now it was safely protected in the mother's womb but now it's out in the open so it is exposed to lot of germs and pathogens in order to build its immunity the baby requires these antibodies which is provided in the first milk which is called colostrum clear to all of you now lactation also involves a reflex which is called the suckling reflex okay now what happens here is now there are a lot of nerve endings in the mother's mammary glands especially in the nipple the region of the areola these are highly sensitive regions now when the baby is suckling or when the baby is uh, breastfeeding then what happens is these nerves which are present in the nipple and the areola of the mother they are activated and they carry the signal all the way to the hypothalamus and now what the hypothalamus does is the hypothalamus will act on it will produce a hormone called oxytocin see the chart here isn't it and now the oxytocin that is produced by the hypothalamus is stored in the posterior pituitary gland and this oxytocin is released into the blood stream and this oxytocin will help in easy flow of milk it causes the mammary lobes to contract and allows the milk to flow down did you understand what i'm saying so continuously the milk is let down by the mammary tubules by the mammary lobes because of this hormone called oxytocin so oxytocin is the one that is responsible for release of milk there is one more hormone which is not mentioned here this reflex also stimulates from the hypothalamus it also stimulates the anterior pituitary gland this is the anterior pituitary gland to produce a hormone called prolactin p r l and this hormone it helps in secretion of milk more secretion of milk see the difference one hormone for milk secretion and one hormone for milk let down or milk release so as long as the baby is being breastfed then the mother's posterior uh, the anterior pituitary is going to produce prolactin 
and her posterior pituitary is going to release oxytocin so as long as she breastfeeds her child there is continuous production of milk and there is continuous release of milk and this neural mechanism is referred to as the lactation or the suckling reflex clear to all of you here you should remember this part of the brain which is i'm shading right now this is the hypothalamus because you know the hypothalamus is the one that controls the pituitary gland okay so that completes the part of lactation now if we move to to give you some uh, additional uh, information whatever i had told you in bits and pieces uh there is a confusion between now in the textbook they have considered days of pregnancy but usually when we discuss about the timeline of human development we take into account what is called the embryonic age of the developing embryo what do you mean by embryonic age embryonic age means say for example fertilization takes place this will be day zero then day 1 so whenever the fertilization takes place that will be day zero isn't it then 1 2 3 day 4 day 5 day 6 day 7 day that means we have completed one week after fertilization by the end of the 7th day the embryo gets implanted implantation happens so then it it starts we start with the second week first week second week and then third week fourth week and so on so please remember when we discuss about now this is mostly for additional information to help you in your competitive preparation those who are interested this is not the pu part so when i say third week for example if i say week 3 of embryonic life what should you think of you should say it is third week from the day of what fertilization now tell me where is the mother pregnant and where she is not pregnant now during this first week where is the first week development taking place it is taking place in her fallopian tube so during this the mother is not pregnant now here implantation takes place so the mother is now pregnant pregnant not pregnant so why she is not pregnant at this point of stage because here from day 0 of fertilization till the end of day 7 the embryo is in the fallopian tube it has also reached the uterus but it has not attached to the uterus the blastocyst has come to the uterus when does it attach by the end of day 7 after day 7 beginning of the second week it attaches to the uterus correct so the entire first week is spent in the fallopian tube in the cavity of the fallopian tube and in the cavity of the uterus now since it has not been implanted we say that the mother is not yet pregnant when is the mother pregnant from the second week of embryonic development onwards second week third week week 4 etc so generally for timeline we consider the embryonic age it is also called the post conception age post conception means we have taken into account another term for fertilization is conception conception is nothing but fertilization i've tried to simplify it for you if you're confused please go through the video again 
you will understand better so first week the embryo spends in the fallopian tube and the uterus it is the time when the mother is not pregnant second week onwards the embryo spends its time attached to the uterus because the second week onwards there is implantation that is the time when the mother is pregnant so whenever i use the word week 6 week 7 week 8 you should remember it is the week starting from not from the time when the mother became, not from this point when the mother became pregnant, but it is from this point when fertilization took place. Is that clear? And what is this age of the embryo called or what is this timeline called where you take into account the time of fertilization and not the time of pregnancy? It is called embryonic age or post-conception age. It is more simpler to learn this way because we are going to take into account even the formation of zygote because when fertilization happens on day zero, zygote is formed. Isn't it? So from that zygote, we are taking that also into account. That's why it is advisable, it is easier to learn the timeline in terms of the embryonic age or the post-conception age. Okay, then what are some things which I told you very clearly? I told you that about week 8 to week 9 onwards, we should call the embryo as fetus. Again, when I say week 8 or 9, that means 8 to 9 weeks have passed from time of pregnancy or time of fertilization from the time of fertilization please remember not pregnancy from the day of fertilization eight to nine weeks have passed when i say eight to nine weeks it is two to 2.1 months so we say that by the time the embryo has completed two to 2.1 months of development we should start calling it as what we should start calling it as fetus is it clear to all of you okay then so eight to nine onwards it is the fetus now going a little behind i want to stress upon week four and uh, a little behind week three of embryonic development and week four of embryonic development i'll be telling you probably a few highlights not all the milestones a few milestones okay week 3 of embryonic development okay so during week 3 what happens is the primitive heart tube starts forming that means the structure which in the future gives rise to the heart now week 4 is very very important. Week 4 means 1 month since the time of fertilization, not pregnancy. I am repeating this again and again. Now this is when the heart bulges and starts beating rhythmically. you understand so week 4 is very important because it is during week 4 that the heart bulges and the heart starts beating rhythmically another thing happens during week 4 from the time of fertilization now you answer this question I'm not going to give out this answer week 4 from the time of fertilization has implantation occurred or not occurred you only tell me I will not answer this question okay so you will answer it you will find out the answer and it's for your own good please understand week 4 my question is has implantation taken place or not okay another thing that happens here is arm buds appear and tail is visible see how surprising we have a tail when we are an embryo we are still not a fetus arm buds leg buds are not formed arm buds are appearing and tail is visible 
okay so these are some of the highlights i wanted to tell you now let us straight away jump to week 13 so you tell me how many months have passed week 13 means week 12 makes it three months so 3.1 months have passed from the time of fertilization now during week 13 this is the best time for prediction of sex is 100% accurate why because the development of external genitalia is finished at this stage the external genitalia has completely developed the vulva in female and the penis and the scrotum in male so by 3.1 month that is week 13 it is the best time to predict the sex of the child okay then something very interesting i would like you to know about week 18 also now tell me which month is week 18 four and half months now during this time during this uh, 18th week something called quickening happens what is this quickening quickening means the mother can for the first time she can feel her fetus moving inside her womb so quickening takes place during the week 18 so th these are some of the fascinating things there are a lot more things that we could learn about the development of the uh, embryo but just to make it a little bit interesting and to also provide you with certain additional points we have included week 3, week 4, week 13, week 18 and in between I told you from week 8 to 9 onwards that means the embryo has now completed 2 to 2.1 months of development. You can no longer now call it as an embryo. You will call it as what? You will call it as fetus. Clear to all of you? I hope you remember. I am telling you once again when I say weeks I am talking about from not the time of pregnancy but from the time of zygote formation that is the day of fertilization all right so what did we learn in today's class so in today's class we learned about the meaning of the term pregnancy the functions of placenta very important essay type answer salient time points the important milestones we learned with lot of additional information also those who are interested can go through those additional inf uh, additional uh, material that I have discussed with you people. Okay. And uh, the mechanism of parturition or childbirth. We learnt about the fetal ejection reflex and the role of oxytocin. And we learnt about the differentiation of mammary glands. And we also learnt about another reflex involved over there. The suckling reflex which is responsible for production of both prolactin as well as oxytocin. Now the homework for today will be uh, define placenta for one mark then name any three hormones secreted by the placenta three marks how is the first sign of the growing fetus usually noticed one mark what is parturition add a note on fetal ejection reflex two marks which hormone is involved in induction of parturition one mark what is colostrum mention its significance so please go through your NCRT thoroughly and you're good to go as far as your homework is concerned so let us wrap up today's class over here until next time see you all take care